It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Dr. Peter Hurst, Executive Director, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Dr. Hurst, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the fifth in our MIT Sloan Executive Education uh, Innovation at Work webinar series. Uh, I'm delighted to say we have over 1,300 people who have registered uh, for, for this webinar uh, today, and we're very excited uh, to have with us uh, Professor Stephen Eppinger. Uh, I think that you're about to be looking at Steve's uh, biography, so I won't go through it in full. Uh, Steve is the General Motors LGO Professor of Management, Professor of Management Science and Innovation, and a Professor of Engineering Systems uh, at MIT. Uh, and as you can see from Steve's biography, which uh, I think speaks for itself, uh, Steve is truly uh, one of the world's greatest experts in the field of uh, product design uh, and development. We're very uh, pleased that Steve uh, teaches regularly in our executive education programs, both open enrollment and custom programs. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit more later on uh, today about a couple of the open enrollment programs that Steve uh, teaches in and also give you some references to uh, his excellent uh, books. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I'd like to really just hand over to uh, Steve and invite him to uh, tell us more about uh, what he's going to talk with us about today. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's web webinar. Uh, the topic is systematic innovation, and what I'll do today is first I'll talk about innovation itself. What, what do we mean by innovation when we teach about innovation here at, at MIT? And, and then uh, there's, there's been a lot of talk lately, the last 10, 15 years, about design thinking. So I want to clarify what exactly that is and how does it apply to being innovative. Um, and then the second key idea is about systematic processes. How exactly do we become systematic at something so seemingly unstructured as innovation? So, so I'll explain exactly what we mean by systematic work processes, and then how do we apply it to the design and innovation process. And I'll do this with um, examples uh, from my work and, and from work with um, lots of different um, companies. Uh, so uh, let's get started. When we speak about innovation, we say, well, you know, that's about doing things new and different. But um, there are a lot of ways to do things new and different. Um, we, we like to think about it as, well, successful innovation um, is successful because it addresses three different aspects. Um, so one is the innovations, the products, the services need to be desirable from a people and human uh, perspective. And some of us naturally come about um, challenges from that perspective. Maybe um, industrial designers, some marketing folks, they think a lot about customer needs and, and desire. Um, others of us um, address problems from a, a technical perspective, you know, engineers, for example. Um, and successful products and services need to be technically feasible. So there are key challenges there. And then third, the business dimension. So how do we make sure that whatever we do has some viable, sustainable business model around it? Um, and, of course, many of us are trained um, in business and have that perspective uh, more naturally front of mind. Um, and what's special about successful innovation, particularly for technology-based uh, businesses, is that all three of these dimensions need to be satisfied um, and, and satisfied simultaneously. Uh, so let me talk about just a few examples of successful products and services that are successful using this framework of these three um, perspectives to think about that. Uh, so the, the first example uh, is a product that many of us have bought in the last uh, couple of years, uh, so the Nest Learning Thermostat. So Nest is a California-based company um, that looked at a pretty mundane product that we all have in our homes, um, a thermostat. Um, and they, they, act, they particularly looked at all the programmable thermostats that we've been buying for the past 20 years and found that almost 90% of them almost nine out of 10 were not being used as they were not being programmed. So they're just a, a digital manual thermostat. And so the people dimension is, well, people find it really difficult to program a thermostat. 
So the way they addressed this is they said, well, let's not just make it easy to program your thermostat. Let's make it unnecessary. Um, so they developed what they called not a program but a learning thermostat. And so, in fact, it, uh, with, with sensors, it actually figures out, uh, you know, when you're home and it learns when you like to have it a little warmer and when you like to have it cooler and so forth. And then they developed a really effective um, uh, mobile phone apps as well as web interface and then developed a viable business model around it. I don't think there's anything particularly special about the, the business model um, in, in this case, uh, but you can think about this as all three of these have to be addressed, and they were in this uh, highly successful new product. Uh, I'll talk about just a few other examples. So an auto industry example, and BMW comes to mind. Uh, BMW has been really successful from a technical perspective for many, many years, leading in automotive engineering. Um, but also, they create what I think of as a really effective, holistic experience for drivers and passengers and owners of, of the automobiles. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of a multi-sensory experience to, to, to use this, this product um, in, in every sense of that. Uh, so this has been really successful, I think, because their designers and engineers think really carefully about how do we create a complete user experience um, that's really not only innovative but fun. Um, another example, uh, these are actually a couple of former students of ours uh, from here, uh, created uh, a new business called Airbnb, which is, which is changing the way um, we rent uh, rooms when we travel. Uh, so these are actually a couple of designers from the Rhode Island School of Design who took my class here at MIT. Um, and uh, living in, in San Francisco, they said, you know, we could rent out that space in our apartment. So it started out as air bed and breakfast, so like an air bed in your apartment, uh, that became a bed and breakfast um, service. And the idea is you could rent a space in your couch, you could rent a spare room, you could rent an entire apartment, a house, a chalet, um, a treehouse, an igloo, and so forth. Um, and, and today, they're renting millions of, of room nights every week um, all around the world in like 190 countries. Um, so when you think about this, you know, why is this desirable from a people perspective? I mean, it, it's just room rental, right? Um, well, actually, honestly, when I first heard about this, I said, you know, why would I want to stay in someone's apartment? I, I'd like a hotel room. And, you know, would I want someone stranger staying in my house? Well. Well, that's why you go and talk to more than one customer, uh, for one thing, because you know, maybe it's not right for me in my market, but it's right for some other people in other, other markets. Um, so they figured out, and I don't think it was easy to do, but they figured out that this service would be desirable from a people uh, perspective. They made it work technically with the web base and the mobile phone interfaces. They used, I think, a lot of really clever design in both promoting it and making it easy to use. And, of course, they developed a viable business model around it, which is essentially a few percent from the host and a few percent from the, from the guest. Um, another example that I kind of like just because this is a product that, frankly, exceeded my personal expectations. So iRobot is a, another MIT-based uh, company um, that um, has sold millions of these little robot vacuum cleaners. And, and really, it, it doesn't clean or vacuum uh, the way you or I would clean the house. It uses, you know, algorithms and random patterns and so forth and does actually quite an effective job of it um, in, in a way that people find kind of fun, not only easy to use, but fun. Um, a lot of sophisticated technology uh, went into this. You know, years and years of mobile robot research um, underlies uh, the technology that's in here um, and, of course, built a business around it. It's not their whole business, but it's a pretty effective and important part of their business. Um, and then, uh, so one last example, it's, um, it's easy to talk about Apple when we talk about innovation. They've had such a track record of innovation over, um, particularly over the past 10 years. Um, and we'll see, you know, how long they can keep that up in the next 10 years. Um, that's, that's really um, an important question today in the business world. Um, but when you think about it, what have they done? They've created an amazing user experience for their products and services, so it's desirable from people's dimension. 
they're leading in technology and using new technology to make this happen. Um, and they've innovated in business models, um, you know, with um, apps and iTunes and so forth. Um, they're not just selling products, um, but selling uh, services online. Uh, so these are uh, these are five different examples from different businesses and different industries, all of which have been successful because they've innovated. And I think this little framework of the three dimensions um, is, is a useful way to think about why and what kinds of innovations uh, we have. So next I'd like to talk about uh, design thinking and the kind of uh, skills that underlie what we're calling design thinking today. Um, now, this is, I, I know it's become kind of a buzzword the past 10, 15 years. Uh, people, a lot of people are talking about design thinking. In fact, I looked on Amazon this morning. There are 20 books that I could find with the title design thinking, or with the words design thinking in the title. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this area. I think there's a lot of confusion around it. Uh, a lot of different definitions of it. So I'd like to clarify what I think is really important here, why it's, okay, well, it's a buzzword, you know, and um, what's really the key idea and what's important. Um, so the first thing is that effective design has a process. We don't just do everything at once. It's not a unstructured just do it approach, but in fact, um, there are stages or phases or steps to take. Um, and so just splitting up the process of designing something into three phases, as I've shown here, explore, create, and implement, I mean, that alone is the beginning of a process. And we'll build up into more elaborate processes in a moment. Um, and then second, that effective designers, sort of people who think in this way, have a certain set of skills or habits that they apply um, to be effective in each of these three phases. So for example, in the explore phase, um, given a challenge, a design challenge, what most people do is they say, oh yeah, I, I got that, I understand that challenge, and then they set about trying to solve it. Um, what, what effective design thinking teaches and what designers do by habit, by nature, is they say, okay, I think, yeah, sure, I understand that because I've had that, I've experienced that problem, but I'm just one person. I'm going to go and see that is literally go out and talk to customers and truly understand their needs and experiences because everybody else, all the world of customers, have different experiences than I have. And just recognizing that my own experience, as valid as it is, it's not, it's not everything. Um, so we validate through this exploration phase and actually try to generate some special new insights there. And then in the second phase, which is called creation, I mean, that's sort of the fun design creation part. Um, the important skill that effective designers bring is to, while they think they can solve the problem, and engineers and others, you know, will readily solve problems, um, they don't just start with, they don't just take their first solution. In fact, they, they take their first solution and set it aside. And they develop another one and another and another, and they may develop 50 solutions or 100 solutions. Um, because as, um, as Thomas Edison said, you know, how do you come up with a great idea? Well, start with a lot of ideas. So the idea of using multiple solutions and then combining and refining and improving them until we have some really great ones to proceed with, that's really critical here. And that's a skill or a habit that effective design process teaches and effective designers uh, use. And, and then finally, I'd, I'd say in, in the implementation phase where there's a lot of iterations to get the details right, um, effective designers tend to really focus on, it's not just getting it approximately right, but in fact getting all the many, many details right at the same time. Um, and that involves trade-offs and hard work and focus and attention on detail. Um, and that's a set of skills that, that we can, that we can um, teach and we can, uh, we can practice and improve. So this is a quick summary of what I think some of the key aspects of design thinking today in practice, particularly for product and service design. Um, lots of businesses are applying this. Lots of people are applying it. It's not just people trained with designer in their title. Um, 
for example, and here's a one interesting company example. Uh, so the company is IDO, which is a product design firm. So, you know, if anyone's going to practice this stuff, it ought to be a product design firm. Um, so they've actually won more design awards than any product design consultancy. Uh, so it's worth looking at. There must be something special about them. Uh, well, one of the interesting things is they've applied this design process, design thinking approach to all kinds of products in different industries. For example, you see here uh, sports equipment, medical equipment, automotive, consumer products, retail spaces and environments and so forth. Um, so they've developed some methods, a process, I would say, of applying these types of skills in a way that it, it can apply to all kinds of products and industries. Um, and, I, I, and I use this example to to, to build up to the idea that we're calling systematic innovation. So how is it that they can be not only successful, but successful in so many different areas in applying essentially the same process? And I would argue that it's about being very, very systematic about it, such that it applies no matter what the challenge is. So I want to build up on, on that idea. I think before I do, since we're um, maybe about halfway through, through the, the seminar, let me just uh, pause and ask, does that make sense? Um, and if there's some clarification and questions around that, I'd be happy to take them now. So really, there's been a lot of talk around design thinking. I've explained it in, in maybe a different way than you may have heard before. Um, is that roughly right to, to people? And um, Or is there some clarification I can do? So we look at the Q&A coming in. Is that... Uh, Sure. Thanks, thanks, Steve. And maybe while people are just uh, asking some questions as they come in, I could uh, just start with uh, with one, which is a very basic question of, so how does design thinking as you think of it differ from what some people might just say is good, straightforward business thinking? Okay. So design thinking, as I've described it with, in, with this diagram here, um, so well, business thinking has a, a business process around it, and the business thinking, I think, in terms of the um, uh, the diagram with the three circles, so business thinking primarily looks at how do we make money at this. And design thinking tries to balance that. So, okay, yeah, we're going to make money, but how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that by creating a product that's highly desirable, creating a service that's technically feasible, and putting this all um, t together. So I, I suppose I would say business thinking emphasizes one aspect more mm -hmm. than the others, mm -hmm. and design thinking tries um, to, to balance those. Okay, that makes sense. We have some quite a few questions coming in from people. I'll try to sort of uh, merge them and paraphrase them, uh, which who are essentially asking, uh, they, they, they're seeing examples that you've given that they're describing as being sort of inventive products. Uh, and wondering whether this framework and the way you think about it applies sim equally to services and processes and, uh, and things that aren't inventive products yeah. in quite that way. Yeah, so um, I've looked quite a bit at development of services in addition to products, um, and essentially the same process applies. You know, you still got to go out and understand customers. You've got to understand the market. You've got to understand your competition. Um, for service development, particularly being innovative in services, it's, it's worthwhile thinking about many, many solutions and many ways that we can deliver or satisfy customer needs. So these same uh, challenges apply, and in fact, many of the same processes apply. There are certainly some differences you know, in, in service design. Um, we talk about user experiences in terms of cycles and many, many types of interactions. But Honestly, I think the differences are rather few and that the similarities and processes um, are really, really strong. Uh, so, in fact, the same thinking applies. And, uh, I mean, as evidence, you know, IDEO, for example, that, that I just talked about, um, half their business is in services. So, so they're applying the same approach uh, to services and products and so forth. Great, thank you. Maybe one last question before we, before we move on. We, we clearly have a very... Uh, educated audience here, some people are relating what you're talking about to the subject of systems thinking uh, and wondering if you could make that relationship a little clearer. Yeah. Uh, well, 
So system thinking would be another webinar that you know maybe we should have one on that uh, because it's I think it's also something that's lots of different ways it's been defined and 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 described in lots of different ways. Um, so one way to think of connect design thinking with system thinking is well what we're designing the thing the product or the service or the business process it's embedded it works within some larger system. So you know, customers take the product home and use it in their you know automobile, or they use it in their kitchen, or whatever. Customers, uh, you have a business process, and you're innovating one thing, and it works within the context of some larger environment. So system thinking is an important way of thinking about that whole environment and how does this thing we're they're creating um, work in the context of the whole thing. Um, and the benefit of that system thinking is often to come up with innovations that are more effective and don't have maybe bad or unintended um, side effects. At least that's the way we're. That's one of the ways in which we're using system thinking and teaching it here at MIT. This might be a good introduction to systematic. <laughs> okay, so good. So so let me uh, move on and, and talk about systematic uh, process design. Uh, <clears throat> So when we talk about processes being systematic, this is just a general definition I'll start with, and then we'll apply it to innovation. When we talk about processes being systematic, we say, well, it's got to have, start with three things. Um, so one is the, the process itself, the work, needs to be procedural. Um, that is, we write it down. We have a set of step-by-step -step instructions, and what they embody is not the only way to do the work, but the best way we know now today how to do the work. It'll get better as we learn more, but today we've written down and we try to practice and teach the best way we know. So that's the first thing, which we call precise work. Um, the second thing is we're precise not only about the work we do, but also about the input and the output. Uh, so the work would could fail if we have the wrong inputs. So if the inputs are not quite right and not usable and complete or whatever, uh, then the work can fail. And also, um, if we do the right work on the right inputs, we should have correct outputs so that we have expectations on what the outputs should be. And that these things are all measurable. So the third thing is that we can measure them. So we can check the output and say, did we get this right? And if not, well, well something went wrong and we, we've got to fix that. And if we did get it right, we can move on. So those are the three elements of the work. And then how do we create this into a whole process? Uh, so uh, this next picture talks about creating a whole process around it. So of course, based on that test, if the work is right, we can move on to the next process. But if it's wrong, if we failed this test, uh, we don't think the work is done well enough, um, then that reveals a problem. So maybe it reveals some ignorance, we didn't fully understand it. Maybe it revealed that we made a mistake on the input or on the work or something like that. And then how do we solve that problem? And so the idea is not just to correct the error, but to solve the problem, which was in the input or the process or so forth. Um, and the idea here of systematic process design is that that's not simply only up to the worker, but it involves the supervisor. Because the supervisor um, is in charge of sort of keeping track of this knowledge, so it's not simply in the worker's head. Um, so when we solve the problem, maybe that it results in better sort of knowledge at the worker level, better training, or maybe better process design, and now we have a better, more procedural, best known way. Um, and of course, if the supervisor can't solve that problem, then that reveals you know his or her um, ignorance and inability to kind of deal with this. And so the idea is that that um, should get raised up to the next level up. And so that's the manager and and so forth. And so so systematic processes have these characteristics. And so we say that it embodies the best way we know how to do the work. It immediately reveals when we failed to do that, the defect in execution. We solve problems, and we capture the learning in an improved process. Um, so systematic processes are procedural. We have step-by-step -step instructions. They're teachable, so we can teach those instructions and learn the right way to do the work. They're repeatable, uh, so if we have the right inputs, we do the right work, we get the right outputs. They're reliable, um, they're controllable because supervisors get involved and understand the process, and if not, it reveals their problem and we try to solve that. Um, they're verifiable through the test that we know we're getting it right. Um, and then the key thing is they're always improving. 
So every process we have, it only embodies the best way we know today how to do the work and that it'll improve over time. So this idea of systematic processes has been applied in sort of lean process management in lots of industries, um, including uh, maybe most famously Toyota in the auto industry, but it's been applied in lots of other industries as well. Um, it's been applied really effectively first in processes that are kind of physical, like production processes, and now we're starting to apply these to knowledge processes, such as innovation. And innovation is a particularly challenging area to apply this because, you know, you think, well, innovation is supposed to be new and different, and how can you have detailed instructions and steps for everything? But in fact, we can have detailed instructions if we take this process-based uh, perspective. So let me, let's look at now how do we apply this systematic process design to innovation and design and development processes. Um, so first, if we're going to have step-by-step -step instructions, well, what are the stages or phases? What's the flow? Uh, so this is a, just a generic product development process, pretty similar to a service development process as well. And the idea is that, well, if we do the right job in, let's say, the planning phase, we ought to have a measurable, testable output. And if we did the wrong job in the planning phase, we should know that. And so to make a product development process truly systematic, at every stage or phase, we have to have measurable inputs and outputs where we would know whether we got them right or wrong. And we have to have these learning loops built in. So it actually helps to split these things up into pretty small tasks. So content development could take weeks or months. Um, so how would we split that up? So if we can split concept development up into, in this case, seven activities that I've got shown here in this slide, um, what are the inputs and outputs for each one? So to take a process like this and turn it into a systematic process is a matter of saying, well, there's a method for, I'll just pick concept, generate product concepts, the third box. Um, there's a method for that. There are steps, there are instructions. We have inputs, and if we don't have the right inputs, we can't do the right job. We ought to have outputs, and if we don't have the right outputs, then we know we failed. And so we can take this idea of systematic process design, and once we've laid it out into steps with procedures and instructions, we can actually apply this systematic uh, process design to it. Uh, so here's an example from uh, Tyco, which is um, a business in uh, it's all kinds of lots of kinds of industrial products, particularly uh, monitoring and control equipment. And so they've taken this PD process, and in a very systematic way, they've laid it out into nine, uh, nine phases. Each of them has a very defined package of work, and there's a way to know whether we got it right at the end of each phase or stage. And those uh, checks are called rally points. So you see the rally points are the sort of the, the, the gate approvals. Um, and so they've turned that into a very carefully documented product development process uh, and made it uh, really quite systematic. Uh, so here's another example of one process step that um, I think one of the harder ones to apply the systematic process line to. So you think about the early part of everyone's process is to evaluate opportunities and think about what should we develop. This is essentially usually part of the planning process. Um, and an aspect of that is I have uh, all kinds of possibilities. What should we work on? So how do you take – it? so you could think of this as the process for developing great opportunities. So how do you develop great opportunities? Well, so this process – it's not the only process, but this process is. Well, the way to do that is to start from many, many raw opportunities, and maybe there's a process for developing those. Uh, it could be an online tournament or whatever. Um, and then there's a filtering process that says, I've got many opportunities, and now it's a matter of choosing the good ones, the better ones, the best ones. And so maybe through, in this case, three successive filterings, I, with hopefully good fidelity, find the very, very best of the opportunities. Uh, but the idea is that we're taking one step in the process, which is developing and choosing the best opportunities, um, and being procedural about it and measurable about it, and we build that into uh, our process. Uh, so it, now I'll just uh, finish with just one last example from 
a company that's taken that and built it into a complete process. So this is a company called Quirky.com. They've been operating now for three or four years. Uh, so they've taken the idea of crowdsourcing, that is using many, many ideas that come from lots of people online, and uh, use that to do the front end of the process, so exploring lots of opportunities. So, you know, we as members of the quirky.com community can go to our, you know, go, to, go into the, the garage and think about, oh, we ought to have a better one of these tools or a better way to clean this or something. And so there's a lot of um, housewares and office and, and sort of workshop uh, products in Quirky. So we all submit them, and they'll get literally thousands of submissions. And then we, as members of the community, will rate them. So we give it the thumbs up or down, and a good idea, a bad idea. And we can make suggestions to improve the ideas, so the ideas get refined and improved. And then the very best of these ideas get taken internally with sort of good traditional engineering internally. So we'll take these ideas and say, all right, we'll figure out how to build this. So for example, the product I've shown here is a two-sided USB flash memory stick. So maybe one side for home, one for work, or project A or project B. So that was one of the ideas that filtered out the very best from the crowd. And then we take this internally and do the design. So, okay, what are the materials and the dimensions and all the details of this and how do we specify the, the, the chips and the circuitry and so forth. And then we'll source those things. So we'll go to contract manufacturers and ask how can we build this and what are the prices and quantities and so forth. And then internally, again, compute so what's a, an order quantity for which if we sell them at a certain price, we can break even. And then they go back to the crowd, to the same members who all rated it and said what a great idea. And they say, okay, you know, here's the price, $29.95, give the credit card. And if we pre-sell enough to our members, who all said it was a great idea, then we know, guaranteed, since we pre-sold them, that we're going to at least break even, and then all the other sales to the whole rest of the world um, are for profits. And interestingly, when you see the price point, it even tells you, and of that $29.95, you know, $8.53 goes to this person who came up with the original concept and 59 cents goes to that person and 68 to that person who improved the idea and 3 cents went to this person who came up with, you know, a better way to do one little aspect and so forth. And so you can kind of see how the innovators are being sort of rewarded back uh, for involvement in the community. So the idea is they're taking a process, making it very procedural and repeatable and, uh, and building it into an entire um, PD method. So now I'd like to sort of wrap up and sharpen up this um, last point about being systematic. Um, so being systematic is really a matter of um, having a process to solve a problem. And what I think is the sort of interesting or magical part about this is, you know, if you've got some challenging problem, you don't necessarily need to know the answer. What you need is confidence that you have a process that can find the answer. So designing and developing that process is as important as designing and developing the product or service that you're solving. Um, so the process would be you know, about def defining the problem, having a good plan, and being really good at executing that plan. Um, and that's how you know, Quirky can say, look, I don't know what's the best idea that's going to come out this week, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to be a really good idea because thousands of people have have suggested and improved that idea. And then we develop the rest of the process around it. Um, so this idea of being a, a process and being systematic um, can be very, very powerful. And it's been applied in lots and lots of ways. So uh, not surprisingly, since I'm here at MIT, I've written a book about this stuff. So we do that here. Um, so this is the fifth edition of our textbook called Product Design and Development. And if you look at the titles of the chapters that I've, I've listed here, um, you can see that it's, um, it's kind of methodical. So there's uh, chapters on each of the methods, and each of the methods has these measurable, knowable inputs and outputs, and has step-by-step -step instructions for each. So it's kind of the recipe for systematic processes, specifically for product design. Um, there'll be a new chapter in the next edition of the book coming out um, that'll have a, a chapter actually on service design as well, applying the same methods, talking about a couple of little uh, sort of twists and turns. 
Um, and finally, we teach. Uh, I teach some courses around this. Uh, so I teach, of course, to our uh, degree students here at MIT, mainly in our master's programs, but also in some of our executive programs. And we have one coming up uh, this fall. Uh, there, I think we have about 10 seats left as of today uh, for this program in the fall. Um, so it's called Systematic Innovation of Products processes and services, and so uh, if you're interested in um, attending this program where we'll talk in some depth about systematic process processes uh, for doing this, um, that program's coming up, coming up soon. And now I think we have time for some Q&A, so I'll turn it back over to Peter to, um, to chair that. Great, thank you, Steve. We have, we have a lot of uh, questions coming in, so I'll, I'll do my best to sort of read through them and to, and to summarize some. So uh, maybe one sort of high-level one, uh, first of all, we're talking here about uh, systematic uh, design. How, how, does, how does this relate to a, a lot of the other uh, sort of techniques and methods or uh, acronyms that people have come across and are asking about lean and agile and PMI and all kinds of other terminology. Is, yeah. is this just another one of those, or is there a, something different about what you're talking about here? Yeah, so uh, I guess the way I think of it is um, in many of those methods, and you, you, you listed some, and I could have listed 10 more, um, yeah, many of those methods are uh, work pretty well. Um, some of them are really hard to apply, and, and people end up falling out of favor for that reason, and you know, there's, there's some trial and error there. Um, but most of them are actually attempting to do what we're talking about here, to be systematic. That is, many of those methods are attempting to actually provide some kinds of instructions. Um, some of the business process improvement methods that, that, that are maybe, maybe in there are slightly different, um, but for the most part, they're not talking about, um, you know, there's no process, it's random, you just have to be really good at this. Uh, for the most part, um, these methods are helping to be more procedural and systematic. Mm -hmm. So we've had some questions also. You had a, an interesting slide where you were uh, showing internal versus external uh, work being done. Uh, and I think there's a lot of curiosity about how to think about uh, innovation and design uh, throughout the supply chain, essentially, and what, to what extent you should really try to internalize these capabilities and when's the right time to look for outside help and whether you have any sort of thoughts or suggestions about that. Yeah. So uh, so first I'll just bring that slide back up for, for a moment. So the example from Quirky is an interesting one because it blends internal and external. And 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 this is just one company's way of doing it, you know, in a very special way to kind of involve a commun a specific community. Um, but in general, what, what businesses need to do is, I mean, they need to make this sort of internal, external, or make by decision for, for lots of things. Um, in general, uh, we want to go to the outside when we either need the capacity or we need the skill. So sometimes we're just missing some skill, and someone else can do that better. You know, sure, I could figure out how to, I don't know, integrate that, integrate that circuit, or design that new new um, system or something. But I know there are other people that have that skill. And these days, with almost all design essentially being done digital, it's easier and easier to say, look, I just need this little task done, and here's this fellow in Italy who can do it for me. And look, it's online, it's quick, it's pretty, it's pretty cheap. Um, so there's a lot of external resources we can use for many, many aspects of design. Um, so I think the mistake that most businesses I've worked with have made is they try to do more things internally than they really should. Um, I mean, and it's just due to their kind of history of trying to be, you know, integrated and complete and secret and so forth. Um, but there are so many great resources out there um, in the community and in the world and other businesses that it's actually worth taking a fresh look at pretty much everything you do and ask, you know, could I do that one better with some external help? Great, thank you. Um, one interesting question I, I, I saw came in a little while ago while you were going through one of your slides, which was uh, a lot of these stage gates, maybe for many organizations, feel like process overhead uh, and uh, a feeling that maybe that can actually get in the way of of the innovation process and whether you've come across that phenomenon or you yeah. have any, any, any advice for people who may be facing that particular challenge? Yeah. Well, I mean, if the alternative to stage gate is no process at all, 
then okay, sure. Then yeah, this is this is process, and yeah, the no process alternative is an interesting one. The trouble with the no process alternative is it's not highly reliable. I mean, it might work once, uh, but uh, if you want to be repeatable and successful in, in the long term, um, it's really helpful to have a process that you can know and teach and practice and improve. Um, I mean, even when we look at alternatives to the stage gate, you know, such as spiral and agile kind of processes that, that are drawn in a very, very different way, in fact, they still have processes there. I mean, they still have, you know, steps that we take. We may take it in a more iterative way, which is the fundamental to the spiral process, um, but there's still a process there. So, so you mentioned just then uh, spiral iterative, uh, iterative design. Do, do you think that there's, uh, there are different classes of problems that these different approaches are more or less suited to, or is yeah. it really a choice that, 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 that you make and you can apply it to any kind of problem? Yeah, so actually some research that looked into that and a couple of papers on that. Um, yeah, indeed, spiral processes apply to lots of kinds of things, and stage processes can, can be applied to pretty much anything is what we found. Um, spiral processes, I mean, the, the fundamental idea of spiral is that you repeat this design build in a layered way. So design, build, iterations, um, layer and build on one another. Um, so for the kinds of products and systems and processes and so forth that are very, very difficult to integrate, it's actually really hard to do spirals um, because you're layering. So if it's hard to integrate in layers, sort of one step at a time, it's really hard to apply a spiral process. Uh, so that's the general answer. Of course, you have to be very specific to, to choose, you know, just what's the right approach for any, you know, anything you're, you're really developing. Um, but it, it's actually worth looking at how to make today's dominant stage processes a little bit more flexible and spiral-like, uh, but it's really hard if integration is very difficult. You know, I've had a few comments come, coming in about the examples uh, that, that, that we've been talking about. And that you know, we, we, we commonly, commonly see examples of uh, the successful application of a, of a, of a tool or, or a method, uh, but maybe it's a little harder to talk about and find examples of when, when things go wrong and don't work as expected. Without naming any names, of course, do, do you have any uh, sort of experience from your research that would be helpful to people who may feel that they, they're trying to apply this, uh, these sort of design thinking and systematic uh, design approach, approaches, but some of the hurdles and challenges that people could be tripping up over? Yeah, well, there, there are plenty of examples of, um, of failures and, and uh, challenges and so forth. Um, so, I mean, not to generalize too much, but I think some some of the kinds of failures that I've seen, you know, without naming names, it's when one of these three dimensions, so when I talked about the business, the tactical, and the human dimensions, when one of these dimensions dominates in an inappropriate way um, and the others um, can't be balanced out. Uh, so, for example, in a project that I, that I work with in, um, I won't even name the industry, but just um, the business dimension dominated to, to the extent that the technical dimensions were unable to succeed. So the business dimensions put on, you know, timing and cost pressures that it was just not possible to technically get the system right. And as a result, the business failed. I mean, the, the project failed um, to be uh, viable, sustainable, and profitable. Um, and, it, and it failed technically, but the source of it was the sort of inappropriate balance or pressure from those three dimensions. Um, so I think that's, you know, again, it's hard to and I really mean to generalize so much, but I think you could say that was a failure of balance, right? Um, I guess the other way I've seen is, um, you know, we have a process, it's just a bad one. You know, we have a process, it's the wrong one. We have a process, but it's an inappropriate one. You know, it might be a good process for something else, but here we have this new challenge. Um, so, you know, one company I was working with actually just this morning, you know, they have a really, really good process for executing engineering but they don't have a really good process for being innovative. And so here they are, they're really good at executing engineering, but they're not terribly innovative. And they may go down the tubes as a result, uh, hopefully they're realizing this problem and, and will solve it, and develop better processes for some other aspect of their business. So I think some people may still struggle a little bit with uh, this notion of 
being systematic and process driven uh, versus, and maybe the versus is not the right way to think about it, being creative and innovative. Yeah. Can you help us uh, just really understand that I think you're saying those two things are not contradictory, but yeah. uh, some people perhaps find that surprising. Right. Yeah, it, it is surprising. And when we go through, when we teach this, so we do exercises in class, we say, look, you know, we're going to be really structured and systematic about coming up with whatever it is, you know, 60 ideas. Uh, and, you know, out of that, maybe three new patentable things will come out of it. But the idea is we'll use a method to decompose and to develop and um, to combine and refine and improve and so forth. And, and but so the point is that, you know, we can be very structured and systematic um, even about doing something that, you know, we don't know what the output's going to be. We're just pretty sure that that structured systematic process, you know, will lead toward a really good outcome. Um, and then the other way to think of it is, you know, this frees you up, but by being structured and systematic, it frees you up to do the creative thinking, the creative work uh, better because you know, it kind of leaves to kind of structure and wrote the more, you know, uncreative, you know, less creative work. Um, so it kind of frees up our thinking to, to do where we can um, add more value. Great. You, you talked a moment ago about the, the, the people dimension when you were talking about uh, bounds. And we've had some interesting questions from uh, the audience about what kind of teams should uh, we be looking to put together to really have a great set of skills and capabilities for hmm. systematic uh, design? Well, one of the, one of the key um, aspects that we teach um, here, and we, we teach about design here, is the interdisciplinary aspect. I mean, this is, you know, we've been talking about that for 30 years, so there's nothing really special and new, except that, um, so if today, <clears throat> if successful innovation needs to have some really good business model thinking, we better include that dimension. And if your business requires some, you know, really effective uh, sort of human factors thinking, you better include those skills. Um, so an interdisciplinary team for one challenge is going to be different than the interdisciplinary team you might need for a different challenge. Um, and the second thing I'd say is um, look beyond the traditional disciplines. Um, you know, we, you know, we teach engineering and science and business here at MIT. And yeah, those are very traditional kind of uh, disciplines. Well, there are a lot of soft skills that we need in design and innovation. And they may come from disciplines that you know you didn't normally have um, or don't have very much of. And there may be per uh, people who are trained in you know psychology or liberal arts or you know design of you know graphics or something like that. And that thinking can be uh, really effectively applied in lots of um, uh, business and technical challenges too. So to expand the team uh, to include people with um, useful other dimensions, uh, I think it's really helpful. And just expanding further on, on, on that question, if we think about particularly large, global, international, multinational companies and, and, and organizations, are there uh, particular challenges uh, as you look at those kinds of larger companies that, that, that they face in trying to implement uh, these kinds of methods and processes? Well, um, so I've done some work in looking specifically at global product development projects and teams and how they work. Um, and one of the key things is since we've digitized the entire design, well, pretty much every business process today, not just design and engineering, um, it enables us to work globally more easily. So, you know, 20 years ago, you want to collaborate with someone in another part of the world, and, well, they may or may not have a good network connection, and you may or may not be able to collaborate with them on a daily basis. Well, today, pretty much anyone you'd want to work with anywhere is likely to have that kind of connectivity. Um, so you combine the tools that we have with the connectivity we have and the kind of global business experience that so many people have, uh, we have really effective ways to work together. So it's getting easier and easier. Great, great. It's an interesting line of questions that a lot of them seem to be still coming in on this uh, people theme uh, is uh, still returning to this question of, of, of the team. Is there a role still for uh, 
non-systematic elements in the process that you see, or do you think that absolutely everybody involved in the process mm -hmm. should uh, be converted to the system to be yeah. systematic? Well, so so I'm a, I'm a very process-oriented person, um, but you know, so I teach this class um, here at MIT that involves uh, our business students, our engineering students, our manufacturing and supply chain students, but it also involves students from Rhode Island School of Design who are trained in industrial design. They're majoring in ID. And so they're taught a design process that's not nearly as systematic as um, the, way, the way I teach it here. And yet we all come together into the same class and we take these students with very, very different skills and backgrounds. Um, and what we learn is that each person's skill set is absolutely critical. You know, we need people who have a marketing focus. We need people who have an industrial design, humans factors focus. We need people who think about people and their emotions and sort of, you know, what drives them to make choices and so forth. So what we find is that this sort of interdisciplinary team um, brings different disciplines and maybe it brings a different sort of ways of normally approaching problems, but what we can do is we can still get together and run through the process. Um, so we find that those different skills actually help to implement effectively all these step-by-step -step procedures. And so, in fact, it works uh, quite well together. Great, great. You mentioned earlier uh, your two uh, textbooks, and this is where we, I think we're getting to, uh, to wrap up perhaps uh, soon. Uh, yeah, I, I have both those books uh, on my shelf. They're quite uh, large and uh, Sort of, uh, there's a lot of content in them. Uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, we mentioned that you uh, you, you teach these uh, techniques to our students here at MIT and also in executive education programs. But re really, you know, realistically, how long does it? Uh, what's what's the investment of time and effort that's required by people to uh, if they really want to get to grips with and and, and uh, begin to apply and become more expert in, in being systematic in their design thinking? How do you get started and just how daunting a task is that? Hmm. Well, um, so the ideas of design thinking that we talked about in part of today's webinar, um, I mean, they can be applied pretty directly on, on lots of kinds of challenges. So, I mean, so if, we, if we just go back to uh, you know, this diagram with the arrow that I presented earlier, um, I mean, that, in that first step, so take, t take that first step when given a problem, given a challenge, instead of saying, okay, I got that, I understand it, just resist that temptation and do some, do some exploration. So go out and, and see the machine, see the people, see the customers, see the challenge in the world, whatever it is. Um, so that go and see step, you can practice that today. I mean, you can do that tomorrow. And so it's actually, um, it may be hard at first to do it, to say, oh, I understand my customers. I don't need to, you know, go out and talk to more of them. You know, we interact with them all the time. But in fact, um, going out um, can be a, just a real eye-opening experience. So the idea is that these skills they take practice, um, but you can start practicing them um, immediately. Um, now, it it actually helps to have some specific instructions of really how to do it, you know, which is why, um, you know, some, some teaching you know, here at MIT and books and, you know, places that you pick up these skills could also help you maybe get there faster um, because it gives you some of the skills to try to apply in practice. So maybe you already just uh, mentioned what would be the answer to, uh, to, to my next question, which is, so what would be something that, you know, we people who are listening to this webinar now, if they turn back to their desk uh, this afternoon or maybe morning, depending what part of the world they're in, or perhaps when they come into the office tomorrow or maybe next week, what's the what's one thing that they can do or the first thing that you'd recommend that they do? Yeah. Um, well, so one thing is, you know, take a real careful look at your process. You know, is it procedural? I mean, put on it, put this systematic work design lens that, that we talked about today. Put that on your process and say, you know, how can, you know, what is the input to this? Is it fuzzy or is it specific and can I nail that down? Um, and what should the output be? And if when I run through this process it doesn't meet expectations, how are we going to deal with that? So you can take a process that's not systematic enough and sort of work toward more and more systematic um, processes. Um, the other thing is, of course, you know, not to push our courses too much, but, you know, we have these courses. Um, so 
on this uh, last slide here, we've got, um, so I mentioned the first uh, textbook, the product design development textbook. Um, we use that in the course uh, coming up this fall. Um, the other course that I teach in our open enrollment programs that I, I haven't talked about today is that the, the research that I've done in design structure matrix has been the basis of um, uh, a course we've been running for a number of years. It's called Managing Complex Technical Projects. And so the second book shown here on this slide is uh, the basis of uh, much of that course. And that course is coming up soon as well. So these are, um, the books are available and the, and the courses are open uh, for people to enroll. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a, a possibility as well. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. On behalf of uh, everybody who's been watching the webinar, we really appreciate your spending uh, this time with us uh, today. Uh, this has just uh, been very fascinating, and I know we've all got a lot out of it. Uh, quite a few people are asking whether they'll be able to get copies of the slides, and we will actually be uh, posting uh, a, a replay of the webinar and a copy of slides uh, on our website, we'll send you an email when that becomes available in a, in a, in a few days' uh, time. So thank you all uh, for, for joining us. Uh, we uh, look forward to wel welcoming you uh, to MIT, we hope, some of you, either to attend Steve's courses or other executive education courses, uh, or virtually for the uh, next in our Innovation at Work webinar series, which will be coming up uh, in the fall. We'll send you more information about that in the next uh, few days when we send out the uh, follow-up to this webinar. So thank you all for joining us, uh, and have a very good day. And we look forward to hearing from some of you about the steps that you take to implement systematic design thinking uh, into uh, the very fabric of your work. Please do uh, let us know how it goes. Thank you. <laughs>